Good evening. Welcome back to another episode of Second Saints. I'm John Hendricks alongside Ross Jackson coming at you, talking about the Saints defense. We're going to preview again for training camp. Ross, my man, uh, it, it's kind of wet out there in New Orleans. You doing okay, man? Yeah, man, I was out there too, and it just started raining, and I was like, I got to duck somewhere, get a lift home. Like, I, I had to do the whole whole, whole shebang, man. I got caught. I got got. <laughs> but I'm good. I'm dry now, and I'm ready to go. How you doing, man? Man, I'm good, you know, staying dry as well. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's just, it is what it is. I looked at the forecast. I'm like, ooh, gross. And but yeah. it's not going to be that way in California <laughs> next week. So, yeah, yeah ooh, just straight up. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Man, well, we got obviously a lot to talk about tonight, as we always do, because, you know, we just can't seem to shut up and talk about this team. You know what I mean? But that's that's kind of the joy and the beauty of what you get with us. But we're here to talk about the Saints defense. We're going to preview for the training camp and the punter battle since we talked about the kicker one the other day. If yeah. you didn't see the offensive side and the kicker, be sure to go back to the last episode that we did on Tuesday. It's all there. It's on Red Circle. It's on Apple. It's on all the major networks, all the, the good stuff. And you'll find us and don't forget to get hit the man. One day I'll learn how to talk. I just had my cup of coffee. And so like, I'm actually oh, like, good, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, but you know, y'all, y'all, y'all know what y'all get with us. So it is whatever. Uh, but again, don't forget to like subscribe, all that fun jazz, but Ross, let's, let's dive into the pressing news of the day, which Honestly, it, it's not that surprising, I, I think, is is because we've been talking about it. And I, I think the only thing that is surprising is Chris Olave. But if you didn't yeah. see or if you haven't seen Saints put people on pup today, so that included Chase Young. Uh, no mm -hmm. surprise there. Neck surgery. And again, we, yep. we said he's doing well, but, you know, they're going to be more cautious than anything. Uh, Juwan Johnson, the foot. No surprise there. Nephi Sewell with the ACL. That's also not a surprise there. Tano with the Achilles, they'd hurt in the offseason. So those four, not really that surprising. But with yeah. Ryan Ramchek, he goes to reserve pup, which is a little bit different, means he has to miss the first four games for sure. We don't expect him to be in the equation whatsoever, but it does, it will end up freeing a roster spot. But the other one yeah. that happened that is a little bit, you know, a thing, just like we said with the Bub Means going to NFI, which he came off today. So that's right. good news. But Chris Olave going on NFI, uh, Nick Underhill and NewOrleans.Football said it's a, a back tightness. So, you know, it, it's a small little thing. Again, he's kind of had that workout issue in minicamp. But, you know, it's a thing. Minicamp moves. Yep. Uh, you know, we expected some of this to happen throughout the process and stuff. But had a training camp. Any surprises except for Alave? And, I mean, this seems to be par for the course. Yeah, everything seems fine here. I mean, guys like Juwan and Chase, they're probably going to come off the list pretty soon or or at least like during training camp, I would say, uh, more than likely because they're on active PUP. They can come off at any time. So I wouldn't be surprised to see them kind of roam in the sideline watching the first week, first couple of days, stuff like that. Uh, and then, you know, Tano as well as Nephi, again, like you mentioned, not surprises. We expect that those guys may even stay on this list going into the season. We'll see uh, how things go. I wouldn't be surprised by that at all, which would then put them where Ryan Ramchick is now, right? Miss four games. They could potentially come back. Uh, and then the Chris Olave one, like, yeah, it was surprising to see it. But then when you really think about it too, you know, he was in the non-contact jersey through most of mandatory minicamp, right. probably hasn't had an opportunity to pass a physical since then and won't have the opportunity to pass that physical until he reports on July 23rd. So maybe we'll see him pass that physical and then and then kind of come off the list as quickly, almost as quickly as we saw with Bub Mean. So might just be more procedural than anything else, but certainly uh, something to watch there. But I, John, I think you probably agree. I think the biggest thing here is is Ryan Ramchek and and with this means for his uh, what this means for his his future as a player or not player. Yeah, I mean, you know, you look at this and, and again, we're not surprised. Like nobody really should mm -hmm. be surprised by this because, I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's not looking good. Like, again, all the reports, everybody you talk to, they're not expecting him to play football. But obviously, yeah. 
you know, it brings up the questions, well, why doesn't he just retire? Well, he can't do that because of financial right. implications. Like, it's not like you just retire and you said, ah, you just miss out on all the money that you're owed or anything like that. Like, it has <laughs> yeah, major capital goes away. implications. Yeah. So, uh, again, you know, we don't expect to see Ryan Ramchick. I I'd be surprised if we see him, like, even at all, like, near a field at training camp. Yeah. But, again, never say never. But, you know, we, we're going to get to talk to to DA next week while we're in California. And, and I think presumably Mickey and might get some more insight. I, I don't know. They just kind of been like mums the word. But at this point, it's just a thing. I mean you're not probably not expecting him to play football. So I get this is procedural, but you know, what is the latest with him that we want to find out? But you know, he, we, it's kind of one of those things where we've kind of seen this and heard this for months and, yeah. and you know, pretty much any depth chart or anything that you do, we kind of just obviously omitted him and, and we hope he gets better and, and he at least sure. has a an old quality of life. But Ryan Ramchek is obviously a big thing, not expected to play. And, you know, that's why they're looking at Trevor Pinning at right tackle. That's why they drafted Tally S.A. Fuanga. I mean, this is just a, a thing where the Saints kind of preemptively knew it was coming. Um, you know, maybe not so much on the early on process, but they found out later that it just didn't yep. work out. But, you know, it's unfortunate, but that is obviously the big thing is, is Ramchick. But, you know, with the other guys, um, you know, Nephi Sewell, he was at, at out there for mini camp. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like he was out on the field. He wasn't in. He's pageant. out there, yeah, watching and He's stuff like that. Yeah, in yeah, the yeah. right direction. I don't know when right. we're going to see him for sure. And then Juwan, we knew he's going to be out for several weeks. Uh, we won't see him, but Chase Young obviously is the next big one that we're going to pay attention to. But with Chris Olave, I mean, that's not um, overly surprising because you said that. And I, and I remember reporting this back in, or, or maybe not necessarily putting it out there publicly but i know i definitely wrote about it but like alave when we were at the hbcu combine and stuff i, I mean he was one of the guys him and alante they were working with matt rea uh, over at the facility and so i think mm. it was based off of some off-season stuff that happened and you know they get all these injuries cleaned up and all that stuff but yep. you know I, I think that plus the the workout at camp now this like i guess i would say is there a reason to really be concerned because it, seeing the signs of this early are we concerned about Chris Olave in his future? Yeah, I think I think we've seen the New Orleans Saints consistently be. Sorry, let me let me answer your question first. No, I, I don't think we have to be concerned about Chris <laughs> Olave or his future. But before somebody takes my yeah out of context and starts getting scared, <laughs> uh, no, I, I think like what we've seen all over the place when it comes to the New Orleans Saints is that they have been in the preseason, in training camp, ahead of the regular season overly cautious with every possible injury yep. and yep. they just don't mess with anything. I mean, Nick Saldaveri, yep. the final day of training camp had some tightness or whatever it was. They took him off the field. You know what I mean? You're done. Right. Come on back. Hey, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. You're good. You know what I mean? It's too so, early for all that. <laughs> yeah. 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 And so I think that this is, this was a part of the mindset shift or change that we saw when Matt Ray first showed up was mm -hmm. if you're experiencing any kind of anything, Get off the field. Don't make it worse. Yeah. Come and tell somebody. Get off the field. And that feels like that's about, you know, this is just another example of that. And look, it's worked. I mean, it's helped these players last a bit more throughout the season. It's cut down on a lot of soft tissue injuries. It, it, it's a part of the larger conversation of how the New Orleans Saints have improved their health. Uh, but I, I think that, like, this is just one of those examples. I, I wouldn't be concerned about Chris Olave at this point. Uh, he could probably be out there for all we know, but the Saints just at this point see no, I wouldn't imagine them seeing, based on what we've seen from them before, uh, them seeing any advantage to saying, yeah, yeah, go go ahead. Like, you go, go full speed, you'll be fine, and everything, right. and risking all that. Yeah, and I remember, I don't remember if it was RFID chips or what they used, but when they first came out, that was one of the selling points of Matt Reyes, that he had the data and all the analytics that showed kind of where their practice output and stuff. I think this might have came from some of the players potentially, but, you know, when he showed up and, and look, they revamped the workout room. That was part of the renovations yep. over at the facility. They added a whole bunch of stuff. Matt Ray's got a nice little office now. They got a whole bunch of cool gadgets and stuff, but, you know, I'm curious to see what they bring out there to Cali for sure but you know with the lave yeah. I, again it's it's something to just keep tabs on but of course i just don't think we're at a point where it's like oh let's hit the panic button let's worry about it because now this is a thing like the saints are just going to err on the side of caution i mean that's just how they they operate and i, I i'd rather them do that than just roll out a lave for 
I don't want to say meaningless practice of a training camp, but you know, you're already going to know what you're going to get with him and, and this offense and stuff. And so, I mean, again, it's, it's, it's a thing, but just like the bub means it was a thing, but it happened and he was fine, you know, a couple of days later. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah. not something I think we should totally, totally just hit the panic button on, but we'll keep yeah. tabs on it for sure. Yeah, if yeah, he for gets sure. hurt in camp, then we're going to watch, you know, back, yeah. back issues, man. That's nothing to mess around with. I'll tell you what, from yep. somebody who's yeah, that's their a... back before. <laughs> <laughs> man, my back still hurts. I, I hurt my back last year and I still got pain. Now I'm not a professional yeah. athlete, nor am I 20, you know, in my twenties either. So I guess we can, we can rule all that out, but yeah, man, it's it that, that, that I think is another one of the reasons to where like you highlight a little bit about where the neural states have like taken caution with all this stuff is that like when it comes to soft tissue injury, back injury yeah. stuff like that they just ain't messing with it and i don't blame them yeah for sure well we'll keep tabs but again that's a lot of moves to be made for the saints today and of course we'll find more and and of course free agency is, is still going on and we mm -hmm. might see a few names and uh you know i know people keep wondering about what justin simmons is gonna do all that fun stuff and me I, too I mean, look <laughs> this is kind of like a quiet you know i saw the other day cam irving got a workout you know that was good for mm -hmm. him and and i think he's gonna latch on with the team he's one of the coolest dudes in the locker room last year like he's like low-key one of the guys that i i really kind of personally yeah i would love talking you start that, seeing some awesome. of that stuff yeah for sure and um you know but it's it's at that point man we're just a few days away man like I know you're going to be heading out there a little bit earlier, but I'm leaving Tuesday and I'm, I'm leaving on a jet plane and I don't know when I'm coming back again. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I do, do, but you know, I do. I do. <laughs> right. Yeah. Make no mistake about it. If we yeah. haven't talked about it and if you haven't heard the saints, when they play the 49ers for that, that uh, preseason game, the team comes back on the 19th and mm -hmm. we'll be back on the 19th too. And then they got all the festivities, two lane practice, super don't practice, all that good stuff. Yeah. Well, yeah. Now that that's out of the way, why don't we talk about oh, yeah. all the things that we were going to talk about tonight, which is the Saints defense uh, training camp position previews. We're going to go through all of them, plus the punter. We're not going to forget about mm -hmm. the special teams for sure. But, you know, look at the Saints defense. Um, it's interesting because you look at some of the pieces on this defense. You know, I, I, I've told people this before is is they're not a, a household name defense, right? Like you look right. across their roster and you say, name the players on the Saints defense, you might be able to get the, the common person, maybe two or three, right? Demario Davis, mm -hmm. everybody knows him. Cam Jordan, right. everybody knows him. Tyron Matthew, but, you know, this is, and I don't want to discount Marshawn Lattimore, but Marshawn Lattimore has obviously been hurt the past couple of years, but right. the Saints defense, no matter what happened last year, they still put in a really respectable numbers. Uh, the biggest thing was when Joe Woods came on board, the emphasis on turnovers, I think Man. that was the biggest yeah difference that this defense made now they got to shore up some things you got to be better against the run you have to finish the play and get after the quarterback but the turnovers helped in a lot of ways and, and if this defense can i don't want to say pick up because this continuity thing that's kind of overrated right i mean you talk to every mm -hmm. player it's like well that was last year but you know there are building blocks and i think when we talked to joe woods he said man we still left a lot of turnovers on the table mm -hmm. but when you look at this defense, which has kind of been the bread and butter for this team where, you know, for years now, like when they turned the corner, started maybe in 2016 where they started retooling and got better and 2017 showed up more and then they just started to being a strong defense. Are we expecting this defense to fall off a little bit with how the schedule stacks up? Because they got some tough opponents and some aerial opponents. Or are we expecting them to kind of continue and uh, keep performing at a high level? Yeah, I think right now and you're you're expecting them to continue to perform at a high level. Um, I know that you know they're a year older and in, in some places and things like that. And and look, I would say not to like challenge or anything like that, but I would say that like the defense has more household names on it than the offense does as of right now. And everything like that. So like I, I always have a lot more faith in the New Orleans State's defense. It's been really good since 2017. Um, and you know, that's Dennis Allen's bread and butter. They continue to invest in that defense. Um, I think that a lot of the, I think the, the, the question that I'm, I'm most wondering is, and don't have a full answer to is, do they improve on defense? I think that's, that's, it. they just kind of stay the same, maybe, you know, improve a little bit, walk back or anything like that, or can they, can they improve, especially when it comes to their run defense, which is where you saw the, the, the largest drop off last year. Now I've always contended and people, people have told me I'm wrong about this, but no one's been able to prove me wrong about it. They just tell me I'm wrong. That's um, important. 
Right. I would rather, <laughs> if I'm an NFL coach, if I'm an NFL defense, whatever, I would rather be a middle of the road run defense as long as I'm a top 10, top seven pass defense. Uh, because then I'm keeping points off the board. If, if, if I have a defense that's keeping points off the board, I, I don't care if I'm 20th, 22nd in uh, against the run. It makes no difference yeah. to me in that case, as long as I'm keeping points off the board. And so that's one of the things that I pointed to at the beginning of last year. And the Saints still finish as a near top 10 slash top 10 defense, depending upon what metrics you're looking at, despite the fact that they were what 22nd in run defense, uh, but they were still really, really good against the pass. So as long as they are good against the pass and can keep points off the board early, which was where they struggled last year, uh, then I think that they're going to be okay. And I don't see anything yet about this New Orleans Saints, particularly passing defense. Secondary is maybe the strongest unit on this team as a whole. Uh, I don't see anything right now that makes me feel concerned about the passing defense there. I don't, therefore I don't see anything right now that makes me feel concerned for the defense as a whole. Yeah. I've always appreciated the Ben don't break mentality, right? Like, you know, mm -hmm. you're going to have yards put up and things that happen, but can you make the stops when it count and force field goals? If, I mean, ideally you want turnovers, you want three and outs, you want to do sure. all those types yeah. of things and stuff. But you know, when they've given up drives or drives have looked not so good, they, they tighten up towards the end and we've seen that year after year and so again it's it's not ideal and sometimes in the run department you know uh, and we're going to talk about willie gay jr but you know mobile quarterbacks mm -hmm. were an issue that's one of the reasons i brought him on board and stuff and there's some some run defense like i remember one of the worst run performances the defense had was against the falcons it wasn't last year but it was the year before when they had like mariota mm -hmm. And I, I forgot who else it was, Cordero, Cordero Patterson. Yep. And then they had a couple Tyler of other Algier, ones that just like, like Algier did it. Like they had four mm -hmm. guys that had like nothing but run success against them. And so, again, I think it's definitely a, a, an area where they have to get better, you know. But at the same time, I'm with you. I, I don't. This is a passing league, right? This is a passing attack league. Yep. Be better against the pass. I, I don't mind getting a, a little bit against the run if we're, they're strong against the pass. Like that doesn't bother yep. me at all. So. The big thing that I'd like to see them improve in, and I think everyone would echo this, is pass rush. I think that's the biggest Correct. thing, affecting the quarterback a little bit more, getting to the quarterback, finishing plays at the quarterback. I think that's the big thing to where I don't expect them to get worse here in 2024 because, in my opinion, they already got worse there in 2023. I mean, look at the – and not even in my opinion. Like, look, 2017 on, within the first 16 games of a season, even when they went to 17 games, they were at 40 sacks. Last year, they failed to reach 40 sacks for the first time since yep. 2017. And so I think like that's the place where you look at and you go, okay, well, there, there's where you want to see them them tick up a little bit better, a little bit more. Sure. And that that's a great segue. We're going to talk about the edge position. That's where we're going to kick off all of our preview stuff. And so, again, yes, you're right. This is a defense that, you know, the almost sacks and the the almost get the quarterback, that, that doesn't mm -hmm. cut it, right? Like it's it doesn't give you anything on a statistical sheet you might get a pressure for it but you know eventually the pressure's got to lead to sacks and carl granderson leading the way there we've talked about him potentially being a double digit sack guy but obviously you have him who's going to be a, a mainstay in this defense you've got cam jordan still isaiah foskey peyton turner guys that need to really pick it up chase young the big addition mm -hmm. there you know tano tano's got the achilles injury so we don't expect right. to see him anytime soon and then they've got nico lalos who was again preseason darling last year and then trajan jeff coat um you know we've talked about it on the drafted program. by the ufl <laughs> yeah oh gosh we didn't even talk about that man that's so weird and just so uh, i don't want to de detract but the ufl doesn't kick off till 2025 so if these guys don't right. have a like a, a, a good future with the saints then they're picked up on a ufl team like that's yeah. kind of where that that goes into so but yeah. the think about the fact the that pick, that like, like john Tra i know right think about the fact that john Tra kirkland was like on the saints roster all season last year and then right. still played in the ufl uh yep. for instance and stuff like that so like that there's yep. that's usually the example that i'll use and then there's jack heflin who said nope nope not doing it i'm not doing it yeah. i'm i'm resting <laughs> which i thought was yeah. a smart move for sure for sure and so this edge group you know uh, we've talked about Turner and Foskey being really kind of the big pieces here, right? I, I, yeah. I feel, and then we've also talked about Cam Jordan and kind of like what his workload looks like. And so I guess, you know, when we look at this position, what are we hoping to see from Isaiah Foskey and Peyton Turner? Is it just the fact of maybe you flash a, a play or two every day? Is it consistency? Is it just positioning? Is it confidence? Like, what do we need to see from Isaiah Foskey and Peyton Turner? And, and, and not that like I'm singling out, but a lot of their pass rush success yeah. is going to depend on those two guys as well. 
Yeah. Yeah. I would say uh, the two things that you want to see are uh, health and consistency. I think those are the two biggest things, uh, you know, going back a couple of years or maybe it was just last year. I, you know, asked Peyton Turner at the podium, like, you know, you've had some flashes out here at camp. How would you sum up your uh, training camp so far? And he said, I, I think you said it, it's flashes. Like I want to be more consistent. Mm -hmm. So that's what he wants to do. And so I think that that's part yeah. of what we want to see from those guys too, is, is, is the consistency. It doesn't mean they have to make a, a, a play every single snap, but can you make a few plays each practice? Uh, with maybe a couple of silent practices or quiet practices and things like that. But like, can you make a, can you make several plays the majority of your practices and things like that? And um, you know, we'll see they, both these guys worked really, really hard over the course of the off season. And so let's see if that work pays off. I, I think that's all I'm really looking for from them. I don't think that yeah. they have to be seven, eight, nine, ten 10 sack guys in 2024 uh, in order to be considered successful. Um, I think they need to contribute in the run game. And then if they can come away with, you know, a combined 10 sacks, not mad at that at all. Yeah, and I don't think pressure is on Foskey to be a 10 sack guy. I think pressure is more on Peyton Turner because this is a contract yep. year. And then yep. outside of this year, I mean, you know, obviously you're going to be paying for your next or playing for your next contract. And, you know, he's he's probably going to be the the Davenport, Marcus Davenport, where he's going to get maybe just a one year deal on somebody, yep. with, you know, and depending on how he does and if he's available, that's going to be a big thing. But we've also talked about the fact that now you don't have Tano in the mix that Peyton Turner's a guy that can kick in on the sub rush and go inside. Right. And so mm -hmm. I think that's something that we're looking forward to seeing a little bit too, and how that comes together as well. But, you know, I think when you look at the saints edge group, it's, you know, if you get a healthy chase young and which could lead to some extra success on one-on-one, -on -one, one-on-one -on -one rushes, which is something Dennis Allen pointed out is, is winning those one-on-one yep. -on -one battles and stuff. I think the other wild card is, is what do you get out of Cam Jordan? Like what is his workload every every right. week, you know, and he's going to be coming in here. healthy. He played, you know, hurt last year. And, and, and it seems like every year, and it's not a knock on Cam because he's as tough as nails, but he seems right. like he's played hurt, you know, the past several seasons for, uh, you know, a, a, a good bit, you know what I mean? And so, you know, how much is Chase Young going to boost this pass rush? And, you know, can Carl Granderson take that next step and be a double digit sack artist for this team? Yeah, that those two questions end up kind of telling you the answer to those two questions end up telling you how successful the Saints are in 2024 as a pass rush team. I, I think that how Chase Young and Carl Granison perform is what effectively paces this defensive line. Uh, how um, Peyton Turner and Isaiah Foskey perform in 2024 kind of raises the floor. And then Cam Jordan, I expect that he'll probably get his lowest percentage of snaps of his career in 2024 just because of the amount of players that they have to rotate now there. But I think that yeah, that's not necessarily a bad thing for him because it might raise his efficiency. You look at Demario Davis. Demario Davis has rushed the passer in each of the last two years less than he has in his entire time since he showed up in New Orleans in 2018. And in both of those, he set and tied his career high in sacks with six and a half. Sometimes deployment out of uh, uh, you know efficient deployment can be more productive than uh, consistent deployment, if, if you will. And so I think that like that's a little bit of what you have the potential to try to put a stake in when it comes to Cam Jordan and could potentially with that rotation help curb some of those injuries that he has seen recently, which have been weird injuries, right? Like fractured yeah. orbital bone. Like there, yeah. there's no, there's no drill for that. <laughs> there's right. nothing yeah. that makes, you know, that prepares you for that stuff. So uh, I think that that's the big thing. The other thing that I'll mention too, just when it comes to Isaiah Foskey's uh, Isaiah Foskey and Peyton Turner, Peyton Turner being in a contract year shows that it's kind of bigger for him for sure. But like Isaiah Foskey could be jostling for position because like, I'm ready to I'm ready to write in pen right now if the Saints are going edge rusher in the first round of the 2025 NFL draft. Like it feels like that's the spot that they end up really, really needing to uh, invest in unless they decide to go quarterback at that point, depending upon how things go here in 2024. Obviously, that would change everything. Uh, but it, it feels like just knowing what this team does and loves um, that edge rusher is probably where they go or going to be looking and so or at least some other edge rusher and free agency ends up joining and so even for a guy like isaiah foskey who doesn't need to really prove anything at this point more so needs to prove something over the course of his rookie contract uh could be jostling for position knowing that okay there's probably going to be a new face in this building in 2025 for sure yeah yeah i i agree i mean you have to and i don't know if they're going to be in a space where they can pay somebody you know what i mean like and right. of course right. young's only here on a one-year deal right you mm -hmm. know what i mean and so uh, 
it, it's something that they're going to have to figure out. And Peyton Turner's leaving, you know, and then Tano's going to end up being a free agent, I think, after this year. So you got some things that you got to figure out for sure. You know, I think one of the other things that I think about too, if just sticking with the edge route, but I'm going to rope this into it. Do we have a favorite or somebody that we're watching to maybe be that Zach Bond role this year? Because I, I don't know if they have that on the roster that we know of that says, yeah. oh yeah, this is definitely the guy. Like, what do they do I, there? You know? I think it's I think it's two players. I I think that it's adding the speed off of the the edge position, which comes from um Chase Young, the addition of Chase Young. And then I think if you're looking for second level pressure, which the Saints are one of the best teams in the NFL when it comes to second level sacks, second level sack production. Uh, I think that's where Willie Gay potentially slots in too, uh, be. because of his ability to rush faster, his speed, all those other things. So I wouldn't be surprised if some combination of those two guys ends up kind of bringing the speed element. Uh, but in terms of who would be the supplemental option, I guess it would be Willie Gay uh, would be the more supplemental option from the second level, much like yeah. uh, Bond was. For sure. And then um, again, it's something we'll be paying attention to. And I think that's one of the answers, like low key answer or questions that we have um, that need answers too. And we want to see how mm -hmm. that comes together, but you know, Willie Gay Jr. Is going to get some, some work in this defense. You yeah, know what I mean? Oh, like he didn't sure. come over from Kansas city just to kind of like, you know, Ole or anything. I know he's won mm -hmm. Super Bowls, but now he's working on having some extensive play time. So I'm excited to see that. So that's your edge group looking at it. A lot of question marks there. Um, you know, again, we've, we've kind of talked about it. I, I know it's an uphill battle for like guys like Trajan Jeff coat, but he is a guy that has potential to be on the practice squad for sure. Him and Nico Lalos. I mean, you don't want to discount them, but at the same time, you know, sometimes it, it works out where they may get their number called. Like, I mean, look at Kyle Phillips last year. I mean, he didn't right. really play a lot of football, but at some point you might have to play, you're right. You know, or just be called upon to play. So it's something to keep an eye on for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, Going to the interior, interior, the fun spot, right? It's Colin Saunders, it. Nathan Shepard, Brian Brzee. They picked up Kendall Vickers, Christian Boyd. They drafted, you got Jack Heflin and then undrafted rookie Kyler ball. I think that's everybody, right? Let me look at my cheat sheet. Yeah. Should be everybody. So yeah. not as many. Um, I think the biggest question marks is who replaces Malcolm Roach. I think that's one of the first things because Malcolm Roach is very underrated and low key. One of the, the better guys to have on this defense and, you know, can the tandem of, of Saunders and, and Shepard be more, uh, more, you know, effective against the quarterback and pressure mm -hmm. and such? I think Shepard was at times and then Colin Saunders, you know, what you kind of get. And then obviously we're eyes are on Brian Brzee. Like we expect him to take a major leap. And, and I saw in the comments here that that. Somebody said that Brazil needs to start inside. Do you do you buy yeah, that? Okay. And what is your thoughts on uh, on the defensive interior? Yeah, I, I think on the defensive interior, everyone's a starter. It, it doesn't matter. Like everybody's going to play about the same amount of snaps. They're all going to rotate and all other stuff. But I agree that like Brian Brazil has to play. Uh, should be asked and given the opportunity to play a larger role, more impactful role, and 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 gather more opportunity. I would completely agree with that. Um, and so I, I think what I'm most excited about when it comes to this unit is Brzee going into his second year in the NFL. Uh, Saunders going into his second year in the system where I know he's going to start adding a lot more to his game. Like the first year with New Orleans, it was about learn the system, get everything down, learn what my responsibilities are, so on and so forth. And then after that, it's all about you know, can where where he can add his ornamentation, add his play style a little bit more. So I'm excited to see how that boosts his game. And I think you get an element of that with Nathan Shepard too. Uh, I think the guy that comes in and helps you out in place of Malcolm Roach, who is a phenomenal run defender for this for this defense, is potentially Christian Boyd. Like John, we've seen him make some nice plays yeah. so far, um, and it just feels like a it feels reminiscent right he's out there still wearing the 97 you know seeing him in the backfield <laughs> making plays in the run game and stuff like that and so um so i think there's that and there's enough competition from the other guys heflin going to his second year uh you, know, you mentioned kyler ball who's a really talented guy uh you know kendall vickers is an experienced player that's got inside out mm -hmm. versatility like there's enough of that talent at the I want to call it the bottom but like you know elsewhere outside of the guys that we expect to be the ones that make the roster to push some competition there to where nobody's going to get comfortable. And I think that that, that is just as important to the development of those players going into their second year, the development of a uh, Christian Boyd in his rookie year, than their actual personal development is to have that talent uh, elsewhere at the position group. Yeah. And I'm excited to see Christian Boyd, who, by the way, mm -hmm. he made an announcement the other day. I don't know if anybody saw, but he's oh, expecting right. a, a child, a baby boy. Yeah. So congrats yeah. and shout out to him. That's awesome. I, I love 
caring about family stuff. So of course mm-hmm. I'm a nerd. Uh, but <laughs> you know, I, again, I think he's somebody that we can look at. I mean, he had a lot of quarterback pressures in college. I think he's somebody that, you know, obviously got on people's radars uh, pretty early. And so again, like the saints getting him, I think he's going to have a pretty big impact. And, and again, I like the concept of a Kendall Vickers because he's a veteran. And again, he's been learning the playbook and, you know, nobody really talks about this guy, but yep. again, when you look at camp and you look at the preseason too, these are guys that are going to probably get significant snaps, assuming that, you know, they are available and all that other stuff. But yeah. you know, the main thing is, can they generate some more pressure from the inside? I think Brian Brzee has a big hand in that. I think Nathan Shepard has a big hand in that. And can they get what they need out of Christian Boyd? Because I think when it's all said and done, you know, we're looking at the starting four. It's going to be Saunders, Shepard, Brian Brzee, and Christian Boyd. I, I don't think there's anybody that would kind of look at that and say, well, I think I picked this other guy. And yeah. you know, it's funny, you talk about the snap counts and all the, the reps. I, I, I'm not going to call out the site, but one of the things that they knocked or said was the Saints don't have, you know, anybody that had 50% or more of the snaps is like, you know, no, that's how they that's always not- run. Like nobody right. does. Yeah. <laughs> like that's how they always have been for years is they use a rotational approach. And so I'm like, yeah. I saw it and I was like, uh, you, you know, it's all of these talking heads who try to cover the team. I don't know. But anyways, I digress. But I, again, <laughs> it'll be fun to see how they do against the 49ers in joint practices. And again, just like the, the edge position, can they win against the interior? Can they be in the right spots? I don't necessarily have to see him say finish the play, but you know, Christian Boyd, I want to see some of that carry over what he did in, in mini camp, you know, and now it's the pads and stuff and him and Carl Granderson, you know, again, Granderson's a guy who made a lot of plays in training camp, whether it yep. was bad offensive line play or just Carl Granderson being Carl Granderson, he made plays consistently, consistently and flashed. And so we're not really surprised by somebody like him having success, but when you talked about Turner and Foskey and some of these other guys, that's kind of what we need to see out of them, right? I mean, that's just yep. it's just how it needs to go. Yeah, exactly, exactly what you're looking for. That's exactly what you're looking for. I like it. Yeah. And then all that stuff you said about Christian Boyd is all true. And then he's going to add dad strength to it. Pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. Underrated. Pretty good. I know it's very <laughs> underrated for sure. So, <laughs> all right. Now we're going to go move to linebacker, everybody's favorite spot. Of course, that DeMario Davis guy, he's the uh, the key keynote speaker, staple, <laughs> leader of the defense, heart and soul, whatever you want to call it. Um, obviously, he needs no introductions, Neil accolades. He's he's DeMario Davis, right? And you've got the best Pete linebackers Warner. in the game. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Took a long enough to recognize that, but we know he's now getting the accolades and stuff. Um, and then you got Pete Warner coming in. Really important year for him, in my opinion. Willie Gay Jr., obviously, the big pickup from Kansas City. Khalid Hudson, I really like that pickup for sure. Him mm-hmm. from Washington, maybe more special teams guy for sure. And then you're looking at Nephi Sewell, a guy that returns um, you know, off the ACL injury. DeMarco Jackson's back in the mix. He's somebody, obviously, that you know is a core special teams player for this, this uh, Saints team. Then you got guys like Isaiah Stahlberg, who you got to look at undrafted rookie, and Jalen Ford. Make sure I'm not mm-hmm. forget. Oh, and of course, Monty Rice, guy Monty that was Rice, on the practice yeah. squad a little bit, and Anthony Orge. That's kind of mm-hmm. where you're looking at. Um, Michael Hodges, their coach. I'm excited about him, no matter Man. who is there, because he can For get real. those guys ready. But you know, this is a crowded linebacker room. We kind of know, I guess, at the moment, the four that are going to be on there, right? You know, Warner, Davis, Willie Gay Jr., and Demarco Jackson, because mm-hmm. Jackson's special teams. Um, I would think Khalid Hudson would be in there, but you know, it's going to be, there's not many spots that are presumably open at the linebacker spot, but there's a lot of, a lot of talent that's there that, you know, yeah. is going to be fighting in, in it, whoever does better on special teams might, might find themselves with a spot when it's all said and done. Yeah. And, and especially with the new kickoff rule, like just, it, it could change, you know, how the saints look at the position. Do they keep fives, they keep six, all that kind of stuff. So we would have like a similar conversation at linebacker as what we have at, at wide receiver typically. And everything and so i think that's going to have a, a big time impact i'm really excited to see jalen ford uh jalen ford started to really finally start to be able to get involved after off-season procedures and things like that uh towards the end of uh mandatory mini camp so i'm excited to see him during training camp um seeing him not go on any nfi or pup list yeah. uh, with rookies reporting Huge. on the 16th i thought was really really good for him uh and so i'm excited to see him man i think he's a really good processor he's a very intelligent player he's got good speed um just does a lot of things well 
phenomenal communicator, phenomenal communicator too. That's what everybody that I talked to uh, over at Texas had to say about him. Like, oh, he just communicates so well. Like, oh, well, he's a good leader. Like all this stuff. And so I, I think that like that's the that's a big thing. So it's gonna be interesting to see. You know, um, I, I think you know uh, where you're what you're gonna see is a lot of three linebacker sets. So that might end up changing how the Saints um, build that roster. Does them playing more three linebacker sets? mean you need an extra linebacker or whoever it is that they want to go about it i think that's the thing it's it's not really a training camp question it's more of a end of preseason roster building question but uh you know people are going to have a real opportunity here to make a statement throughout training camp i suppose yeah no i i think so for sure and and i mean it's it's crowded right and i again mm -hmm. not saying that uh you know these other guys can't make something of themselves but essentially you're fighting for maybe one or two spots that might be open and of course we don't know how the the kickoff rule is going to influence some of that but right you know are, are we i think the the question for me is is how concerned are we about pete warner right like i think mm -hmm. his coverage obviously wasn't the strongest last season but he is it's times he shows like he can play really really strong but i mean are we worried because i know i've seen that you've seen the the top tandem linebackers they don't mention you know, Pete Warner, they put Willie Gay Jr. and Demario Davis in there. Like, are we really worried about Pete Warner this year? Or do you think, like, man, he's going to get it together or he's going to be just fine? Or is this something where somebody maybe could, could uh, pull the rug out from under him and, and start over him? I think the biggest thing with Pete Warner is consistency. I mean, even beyond, like, him as a coverage guy, like, he always starts off so strong, you know, leading the NFL yep. and, like, solo tackles for a long time yep. each of the last couple of years and stuff like that. And so – and then, you know, you see a little bit of a drop-off in the middle of the season and then maybe a little bit of a charge towards the end of the season. And so I think that's the biggest thing he's got to avoid is kind of hitting that wall uh, during the season. And and look, now uh, he's got even more motivation not to do that. I, I think about I think about Paulson and Debo um, last year. Like, Paulson and Debo had this – phenomenal year last year when he needed the most because the saints drafted a guy that could have potentially replaced them. You know what I mean? Yep. And so it gave him, I know that's not the same year, but you, you get what I'm saying. And so like, <laughs> yes. you know, you needed to be, you needed to be able to have that bounce back year after the low year after they drafted Alante Taylor. And then you walk into this year and then he had a great year in 2023. And so can you see the same thing happen with Pete Werner who now has sort of this, you know, really, really good linebacker, maybe potentially breathing down his neck for some potential snaps. Uh, I think for the most part, it's going to be about game situation. Um, you know, maybe in more obvious passing down nickel situations, you might see Willie Gay out there instead of Pete Werner. So you get the coverage of both Willie Gay and Demario Davis. Uh, I think that there would be situations where it's a nickel package, but you want to be ready for the run. And so maybe you feel more comfortable with Pete Werner out there. Uh, I think like that's the other thing too, is like this doesn't have to be an either or. Um, it could very easily be just like we've seen the Saints do at the slot position a few times over on the defensive side, a, a matchup based thing. And so just having sort of this ability to maximize that position, I think, is way more important than who gets more snaps, who plays what, you know, all these other things. And so um, uh, so I would say I'm not super worried about Pete Werner because I don't think that the success of the unit hinders on Pete Werner. Um, I think Pete Werner has an important year because it's a contract year. But I don't think that it's going to be, uh, you know, a situation to where it it really has to be an either or when it comes to Werner and Gay, unless Willie Gay ends up having this like phenomenal camp or something like that and makes it so that you can't keep him off the field. I think that that's the thing. It's not going to be about who performs, who doesn't perform well. It's going to be about who who performs too well. You know what I mean? That could potentially right. shake this up a bit. Yeah, Tedra thinks that. Marco Jackson is going to be one of the odd men out on the practice squad and Nephi Sewell will be cut. I mean, I understand Sewell well, because he's kind of starting bit. behind. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, one of those things uh, he's got to be healthy and come back on the field first, but right. you know, DeMarco Jackson, uh, again, special teams, every drill, on. everything. <laughs> like you talk to Darren Rizzi, like DeMarco Jackson, I, not saying he's safe. Right. But at the same yeah. time, like, from a, a technical standpoint, from a knowledge standpoint, there's probably not many on the team that know special teams as well as DeMarco Jackson does. I mean, that yep. was his bread and butter at App State, too. And so right. I, I'd have a hard time seeing it unless something just goes to the wayside. But, um, you know, I, I think Jackson's safe here. Um, yeah. One of the other things I have for you on the linebacker, is, is this the year we finally see DeMario regress, I guess you could say? I'm never betting on it. I never, I never I, bet on, I, 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 yeah, I never bet on Tom Brady regressing. I will never bet on Demario Davis regressing. Th those two players at their position doing what it is that they do are equally talented to me. And so I would never, yeah. I would I never. I mean, this, 
this dude is superhuman. Like he wasn't supposed to play against Jacksonville last year. Like he right. wasn't supposed to play in that game. And somehow, whether it was divine intervention or something, he made it onto the field. Now he didn't play a ton, but he still played. You know what I mean? He out there. Just, I mean, and he's still tripled, you know, digits and 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 uh, tackles every year. And you know, he's he's still getting after the quarterback. Again, this this defense, if they don't have a Demario Davis, their defense is I don't want to say dead in the water, but like that's just how important he is. He's, he is the backbone of this yep. New Orleans Saints defense, and and he, he's still playing so well. And I expect him to continue. Not after this year, you know. Of course, it depends. But the dude takes care of himself. Like I mean, he's still in great positioning. He's a student of the game. Like he just knows his stuff, and so. I don't know. It's just one of those questions. It comes up every year, yeah, just yeah. like no, the whole for real, for Drew. Sure. Is this the year Drew yeah. falls off or Drew's going to be regressing? And of course, we saw towards the tail end and that it was a little bit more uh, truth to it. But Demario, man, he just he just plays at a, at a level that's just unmatched at times. And so I don't yeah. expect he wears to fall he off. wears the number 56 because that's when he'll retire. <laughs> at age 56 right for sure <laughs> all right let's move to the secondary so we've got the cornerback position um you know of course marshawn Lattimore. they they fixed all of that marshawn's bought in best news possible paulson adivo yep. is entering contract year super important for him alante taylor figure him to be in the slot they draft kool-aid mckinstry but they got some other guys that we got to keep an eye on, especially special teams. That's Shamar Jean Charles. You've got Res John Wright. And then they picked up Mac McCain as well. That was kind mm -hmm. of a later ad. Um, and then they have undrafted rookie Rico Payton, somebody to take it, uh, you know, keep tabs on as well. But, you know, the secondary, they lost Isaac Yadam. You know, that was a, a fairly big loss, but I think that they yeah. backfilled his position just fine. And, you know, I think most of this hinges on what. They what version of Marshawn Lattimore shows up, and I don't expect to see you know Marshawn like balling out in training camp, like because it's training camp, but I expect him to elevate his game. And I think we've always talked about Marshawn is like depending on what receivers he goes up against, there's always that stigma like he plays harder with that. I, I don't know. I mean, look at the opponents he has in the first several weeks. I mean, he's gonna have some some premier talent, and yeah. he wants to to say that he's an elite quarter. You know, I think most of this centers around what does Kool-Aid McKinstry bring to the table and whose reps are you? He's, is he going to end up taking? I think that's a legitimate question. Yeah. But your thoughts on the secondary? Well, the corner group specifically, let's start mm -hmm. there. But your thoughts on this group and is it still a strength of this team? Yeah, I would expect that the same starters they had last year to be the same starters in 2024. But I expect Kool-Aid McKinstry to start a few games. Um, it just does not feel like a good bet to say that you're going to have all three of your starting corners for all 17 games of the season. That's just unlikely to happen. So I think that the draft pick of Kool-Aid McKittry was wise because when you have a 17 game season now, uh, your fourth quarterback's going to have to play at some point. And so having Kool-Aid be able to fall back on is great. They're going to give him the opportunity to compete on the outside and in the slot. Uh, so he could potentially shake things up even earlier than that. Uh, I'm not expecting him to steal the starting slot role. At this point, we'll see what happens yeah. if he actually hits the field. But we're talking about a guy that's got less than 30 snaps of collegiate experience at the position. So I don't know why you, you know, I'm not going to, so I'm not going to walk in with the unfair expectation that he could potentially be your new starting slot corner. He would have to prove that. And if he does, great, awesome, cool for yeah. him. You know what I mean? That'd be awesome. Um, heck of a story, but it just doesn't seem like it's responsible to have that kind of an expectation as of right now. And so not for like us in our position. And so uh, I I would expect the your top four guys to be your top four guys um, and for Kool-Aid to be the guy that kind of slides in if he gets the opportunity, uh, whether that's starting or shaking things up, whatever it might be. And then the, the other guy that I really like in this in this um, equation, too, is, is Shamar, Shamar Jean Charles. I mean, you, you want a guy that's going to be able to come in and do what Isaac Adam was brought in initially to do before he showed that he could be all of a sudden this like fantastic cornerback in the right system, um, you know, but come in and serve as a special teams guy to kind of take that Yadam role. Bam. Like that's definitely a guy that can come in and do that. And in fact, did, did, he was a big part of what the Saints did when JT gray was dealing with his injuries and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, I would put Gene Charles is the other guy that I'm really excited to see. And then again, like you have really good talented players that can slot in and, and look really good in the system that I think drive the, the competition and development up at the top. 
Tyron Matthew had talked about Kool-Aid McKinstry. It was a couple months ago saying like he expects him to have a significant contribution his rookie year. And and look, I mean, we all know he comes from Nick Saban, Alabama, you know, he's, he's coached up and he's, he's coachable. He again, emphasizes on doing things the right way. So I'm really excited to see him as a technician, but you know, again, like you were talking about Alante in the slot, like I I understand is his first year last year, Similar to, you know, like if you put Kool-Aid McKinstry in the slot, but, you know, Joe Woods made it a point to say, you know, I got to coach him better. I didn't do him any favors and, and all this other stuff. And he talked about, you know, just some of the, the areas where he's growing a little bit more. And, and obviously mm-hmm. the coverage assignments are a little bit different, how you stack up against the runs different. But, you know, I think Alante, if, again, we saw times where it wasn't good, you know what I mean? And he got benched, but he responded. Right. And I think that's the biggest thing is that, Sometimes it just doesn't go your way, but how he responds again, like a thing I always appreciate about appreciate about Alante is like, if he gets beat on a play, he can come back and make a play. Right. And of course yeah. I don't ever expect perfection out of him. I mean, who, who does, right? Like it's just going right. to happen in the course of the game. But, you know, I, I think Alante, if he can, you know, stay with it and, and be there, I, I think he can be a, a strong, strong slot option for sure. But yeah. you know, if injuries happen, things go down, no telling what happens. It could be Kool-Aid in the slot. It could be Alante on the outside. I mean, I think there's obviously you're not just going to be at that one position, but for Alante, it's, it's a big year for him. I feel like. Yeah. Oh yeah. This is huge for him, I think. And, and look, it gives you an opportunity as well. Like if, if you see a world in which, you know, Paul Sanadibo doesn't get extended or something like that, which I would be very surprised by, but Hey, look, anything is possible. We, we don't know. Um, then, you know, Alante just continuing to like, plug away at what it is that he's being asked to do potentially sets him up to step into that role next year because he's a guy that was in this offense doing what excuse me defense uh doing what it is that was asked for, of him to do and, and everything and so I, I think that like there's some value in that too to where not only are you vying for your potential snaps now at whatever position or whatever but like you're you're working the good faith or you're working in good faith for your club doing what it is that they're asking you to do which ends up paying off um you know, potentially paying off at a later time as well. So, like, I, I think that there's other stuff to this as well beyond just like what it means for 2024, uh, depending upon what happens with Paul Sinadivo, which that like things could get really interesting at that point. Yeah. And that this thing is, I mean, I get it. Maybe that's not where you want to play, right? But right. at the same time, if you want to get on the field, that's kind of where you have, need to play, I guess. Hey. And, and again, that's just, you got to do sometimes you just, you got to do it. It's like the Taysom Hill approach, man. He I was just, about to say, look at I wanted to play football. Like, just go do stuff right and then just yep. start that. So, but uh corner man that, and, and we've talked about it before on past shows that this is just an area between that and the safety group like they just can't afford to regress but with the suspects that they have in the lineup i don't think that there's any regressing I, if they can get yeah. marshawn back and marshawn can be a shell of himself this secondary is going to be exponentially better than what they were last year and if paulson can play like i mean it makes me excited to think that their past defense could be legitimately one of the top units in the league and i i, yep. I do believe that you know and of yep. course um safety group has a lot to do with that and so mm-hmm. let's talk about them as we get close to wrapping up our defensive series look at the before training camp for the saints Interesting group, Tyron Matthew, Jonathan Abram. You've got Jordan Howden, Ugo Amadi. Uh, then you're looking at, again, JT Gray, who's still in the mix. They picked up Will mm-hmm. Harris. I'm cheating a little bit here. Miller Bradford, yeah, undrafted yeah. rookie. There's Lawrence Johnson. That room. And then Roger Teamer, another one that they they picked up after you know successful yep. tryout. So it's a lot of, lot of players here. Um, not all of them are going to make it. Uh, they're still, and of course, we're going to tackle the Justin Simmons because it keeps coming up. You know, that's obviously <laughs> a big one there. But, you know, safety group, um, pretty interesting because, you know, Tyron, Jonathan Abram, and Jordan Howden, I think that's the only definites in the safety group right now. Yeah. Uh, how do you see it? And what's your thoughts on this group? Yeah, I'm getting more and more convinced that Ugo might be a definite too, just because Ugo Amadi is being used. He was used everywhere throughout. Yeah. Like, OTAs, mini camp, stuff like that. We'll see if that carries over in a training camp. I think it's a big thing you have to watch there. But yeah, I, I'm really excited for this position group. I, I think there's a lot of really good stuff that can happen here. Um, and I think all three of those guys that you just mentioned, um, uh, um, uh, Tyron, uh, Jonathan Abram, and uh, Jordan Howden will all see considerable snaps in 2024 because I think it's Jonathan Abram's role to lose next to Tyron Matthew. And then 
uh, Jordan Howden will probably again potentially be the dime safety that they go to. So I could see like a split between him and Kool Aid McKittry playing whenever they go into dime or, or a six defensive back look, depending upon what their uh, what their thing is. I, I think that you know Howden played p- out of position effectively a lot last year, uh, being asked to play like the box safety role in place of Marcus May, and so I think him getting the opportunity to maybe work out there a little bit more over the course of the off season during training camp, all that, I think all that will benefit him. But I really look at him as the guy that's imme- most immediately behind Tyron Matthew, as opposed to next to Tyron Matthew. Uh, for me, he's the deep safety guy. They really like him in that spot as opposed to safety. Uh, so I'm excited to kind of see like his growth over time, but man, there's, there's really talented players and really versatile players. Like this is such a versatile yeah. room. Will Harris can play anywhere. He's like a defensive Taysom. Um, right. A guy like Roderick Teamer can play in a lot of places. Miller Bradford can play in a lot of places. Uh, and Miller Bradford already stood out for everybody. Uh, you know, I, I just, uh, it, it's an interesting room and it's a very populated room of a guy, of guys that could do a lot of different things. So that room just has whatever mold Dennis Allen, Marcus Robertson, Joe Woods wants in that room, they can build in that room. I think they've done a really, really good job building their options there. And of course, still the potential to add to it if they should they decide. Yeah, and, and I think from a pressure standpoint, I think this is the pressure is on a guy like JT Gray. Like I know he's yeah, been big time. like really stand out, but he's also had some injury problems like past year, and it just hasn't been. And so again, if I'm a, a Will Harris or a Ugo Amadi, like I'm trying to to be that all pro level that JT Gray was on special teams and stuff. And and again, I it, it's going to be fascinating because especially a guy like Roderick Teamer. I mean, that's kind of his bread and butter too, his special yep. teams. And of course it's going to matter a lot for these guys. And, you know, I don't want to take away from Miller Bradford, but you know, he's, he's probably somebody that you, you screams practice squad potential, right? Like, I don't know if he's going to do enough to make it into the, the, you know, final roster conversation. And of course, if they added a Justin Simmons, everybody's going to suffer, right? Like, I, yep. not, I don't mean that in a bad way because no, no, again, but, I don't know how yeah. many episodes ago we talked about the impact of Justin Simmons. We even talked about like, would we take that over what was it Hunter Renfro or something else? And I'm like, it's oh, exponentially yeah. Justin Simmons. Cause Easy. it would, I think it honestly, we talked about it would complete this defense. Like it just would. Right. right? I think he has that. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's a yeah. tough, tough ask, tough draw. Yeah. I think that you, you have a lot of talent in the safety room. I have no qualms with the safety room. I think Jonathan Abram, Tyron Matthew, great starting tandem. I think you're fine there. Uh, would I still add Justin Simmons? Absolutely. And we've seen this new Orleans saints, We've seen this New Orleans Saints do this before. They went and signed Janoris Jenkins when they were happy with their secondary. And literally at the end of the season, they brought him in. Uh, they drafted Paul Sinadiba when they were happy with their secondary. They added Alante Taylor when they were happy with their secondary. They drafted Kool-Aid McKintree last year when they were happy with their secondary. Uh, you know, if you have the opportunity to get Justin Simmons on a cheaper deal, which it looks like even like Tennessee, they went out and they added Jamal Adams. Yep. still have some interest in Justin Simmons. Cause I don't think Jamal Adams completes anybody's safety room. Right. But it gives you another body Not, out there in, in today's NFL. Um, but you know, money is still the issue when it comes to Justin Simmons. So uh, unless that, that price comes down, he will not be in new Orleans. I, I would say that, uh, but you know, we'll see, we'll see. He's got connections to, to, to players, to team, to, to coaches here. Um, and so if he gets desperate enough and he hasn't signed by mid training camp or something like that, maybe that price comes down and maybe yep. he looks for a place that he can go and immediately have a starting role with people that he trusts. And maybe new Orleans ends up being a perfect fit in that case, but I'm not holding my breath for it, but would it make sense? Would he be a fit? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and of course we've talked about it too. Uh, nothing really happens until stuff happens with AK, right? Like, I mean, it's, yep. it's yep. quiet. Yep. It's crickets, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of the, the problem. And it, again, something could happen, you know, between now and the next several days, but mm-hmm. as of right now, that's still the biggest focal point, biggest storyline of, of camp. And you know, the saints do have some, a little bit of money to work with. So it's, and it's not like they couldn't afford a Justin Simmons, but I think a lot right. of this is going to have to do with what can we do with AK? Because I don't know, it might say something if you go out and get a Justin Simmons and you haven't gotten Kamara's deal done. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like good, that, point. good point. Good point. Be a good little point. bit. Maybe a little bit, you know, I don't say sus, but you know, at the same time, I think Kamara's He's gonna raise some priority here. Yeah, it'll raise some raise eyebrows. eyebrows. That's true. It'll yeah. pique some interest. There ain't, ain't no doubt about yeah. that. That's a really good point. It's a really good point, especially in an off season where you haven't gone out and spent a lot of money. Now all of a sudden you're doing that. I'm like, mm, we gotta mm-hmm. talk, you know. Yeah. yeah, good point. For sure. 
Well, that's all the positions. We just got punter left. I mean, but defense again, it's it's not as 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 crazy as it has been in, in past years, but I think it's you know, if you look at that Saints defense, you probably can pick out all the starters. I think there's a mm. few variables here and there. Uh, especially given the special teams and stuff, but again, yeah. most of the familiar faces are going to be there, and and hopefully they stay healthy. You know that's the yep. big thing. But moving on to punter, let's talk about Lou Headley versus yeah. Matt Hayball. That we do expect to see a, a competition. We talked about kicker, and mm-hmm. not that we really do. Uh, again, it'll be interesting because if Charlie Smith can can make something of it, we'll see. But the way Lou Headley was punting in minicamp and an OTAs. Seems like he got a little bit better in the offseason. I don't know for whatever reason, but his his kicks looked a lot more crisp. They looked a lot better. Um, mm-hmm. But Matt Bay- Hayball is a, an Aussie-style punter. You know, he's a guy that has a lot better of a leg, in my opinion, than Headley. But, you know, what are you expecting out of this punter battle? And, and of course, probably Ty goes to runner if it ends up being the uh, the same yeah. Yeah. I think Headley gets the advantage going in just simply being the incumbent, but Hey, we said that about Gilligan last year too. And, and look, the, look at the way that that went. And so um, I know that, you know, for the saints, the thing that's most important are those net return yards. They feel very comfortable with where they ranked in the NFL last year, even though the punts didn't look pretty. Uh, but I do think that maximizing the yards of backing, backing offenses up and, you know, putting offenses in, you know, uh, bad positions and stuff like that is still important. Like you, you had a, pure weapon in Thomas Morstead who could flip a field uh, and everything. And that ended up being really, really important to this team for a long time. And I don't know, I, I want to see that from Headley. Now, Rizzi made a really good point that like the Saints did a really good job moving the ball between the twenties. Uh, it was, it was inside the twenties where they struggled a lot early on in the season and stuff like that. And so it didn't always end up being like the best situation for a Headley to punt. Uh, but especially with his style, everything and so maybe that's something to factor in but you know we see him now adding this more traditional nfl style uh, punt um in addition to his aussie style punt and i think that that's one of the things that i or a rugby style punt that's one of the things that i'm most excited to see is how you can now swap between those two styles to make it work for the specific game situation and everything like that but i think head i think uh hayball's got the bigger leg the more consistently bigger leg let me say it that way i think it's going to be about who can actually locate the ball who can keep it in bounds, who can get it where they want to get it, all those other things. I think that's going to be the thing that ends up being the deciding factor between these two. And we'll be uh, charting the hang times too. Now, of course, yep. like give you a scenario, they they chart, like you typically start punting out of their own end zone and they mm-hmm. work it up to like positive 40 territory. That's kind of how they, they do as far as it, they might add like five or 10 yards at some points and stuff. And so some of the hang times, obviously you want more hang time if you're punting from maybe back in your own end zone versus more or less hang time, depending on, you know, what, what you're trying to do to pin your opponent. I mean, it just, it varies, but you know, it's not always the telltale, but of course you're looking for, like you said, ball placement and, of course, your your gunners and jammers. Uh, what are they going to do? And mainly gunners, obviously. So we're talking mm. about punt team. Um, but you know, what are they going to end up doing? And so again, it'll be a fun little battle. I again, I, I think the only other wild card is like what we said. If Blake Groupie ends up being the kicker, I think Lou Headley's got to be the holder, right? Again, it's just because we've seen. Yeah, uh, we yeah. saw what Groupie did, and it, it's not saying that Hayball can't learn that, but you know, there's a learning curve there where that whole entire operation has to be crisp and, you know, groupie struggles were when Hayball was holding. Now, if that was coincidental or, or not, I mean, it's, it's a thing, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 You got to pay attention. That's a good point. You have to pay attention to the whole operation for sure. And so if you have an opportunity to give another year to uh groupie Headley and, and Zach Wood, then, you know, there's, there's, there's value in that. Uh, you can't ignore if somebody struggles and needs to be replaced. Like, obviously, like at that point, you have to make that decision. But if you have the opportunity to maintain that entire operation, there is benefit there. For sure. Cool. Well, I think that's most everything that we've talked about for training camp, man. It's, uh again, several days away and we'll be out there um, Tuesday when DA talks and I believe Mickey is going to talk and, and our you know, frequency here for second and saints is only going to intensify. So we haven't figured out whether we're going to go like right after practice or later in the evening, once we had time to to kind of digest and stuff, but we'll get all that to you guys and such. And, um, you know, you'll see our faces a lot more, whether that's good or bad or anything like that, whether you like it or not. Yeah. You're just going to have to deal with it. Sorry. You know, (laughs) sorry, not sorry, but you know, uh, 
Ross, I also before we get out of here, I hear it's uh, Mama Jackson's birthday. So yes, that's what yes. I kept happy seeing birthday, in the chat. Mom. That some people were giving some Mama Jackson love. So that's happy right. Birthday, I, put a, I put out a thing on. It was so cool. I put out a thing on on Twitter asking people to say happy birthday, and a whole bunch of people said happy birthday. It was the nicest thing in the world. I thought it was so cool, and she loved it. I still like sent it to her. It was like here's like 200 people saying happy birthday to you, and everything. Yep. So it was pretty dope. So I, I appreciate everybody for for doing that. Uh, and appreciate all the the well wishes uh, and everything, and 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 so does mom. Mom mom appreciates it a lot. Very cool, man. That's awesome. So happy birthday her to her for sure. And uh, Ross, before we get out of here, man, you got anything cooking in the lab? I know we're getting up against the uh, you know the deadline where it's it's time for training camp, and next Wednesday we're go, we're a full go and yeah, everything. Man. And so anything that you got special that's going on, uh, writing wise, or anything for Locked On Saints. Yeah, I got something for both, actually. If you want to know when the New Orleans Saints screen usage Ooh. actually slowed down, when wheel routes stopped being a part of the New Orleans Saints offense out of the backfield for Alvin Kamara, and if you want to know how many outside zone runs the New Orleans Saints have had in each year since 2017 and the how far the averages have dropped since then, I'm going to cover all that. I'm going to cover all that. I want to know more and more and more about how and why Alvin Kamara has been less and less a part of this offense over the course of the past couple of years. It, or not less and less a part of the offense. Why his usage in the offense changed or when his usage in the offense changed. And it's not when you think it was. It's mm. not when you think that's it was. That's always the best that, part. That's what I think was so interesting. We've actually seen this happening for a while now, and it's wild. It's insane. So I can't wait to break all that down. It's going to be a lot of fun. So Ross has cracked the code. So be sure that you tune into that <laughs> and look for it, of course, and such. But good stuff, man, as always. And, and of course, I'm doing my position previews for training mm -hmm. camp, working on the wide receiver one right now. And, you know, it's going to kick into overgear because there's several positions left and, and you know, kind of the same things that we've talked about here. But uh, is is pretty much a preview for it. But there's a lot of cool stuff to to look at when it comes to training camp. And it'll be a different venue. Again, we'll be two hours different on time zone, West coast specific time, yeah. as opposed to those who are in central and all that fun stuff. And so there'll be an adjustment learning curve, but we'll be close to UC Irvine and all that fun stuff. And that's presumably the next time you guys will talk to us unless something crazy happens. And we'll see about, you know, Tuesday after DA and, and Mickey talk. And then if not, you'll talk to us on Wednesday for training camp to get all of the notes, observations, you know, who picked their nose, who did this, who's digging in their butt, all that crazy stuff. Dang we'll right. get all the details Dang for right. on Second and Saints and Saints News Network for writing stuff. But Ross, <laughs> anything you got before we head out of here? No, nah, man, just a big thank you to everybody. Big thank you to you as always. Always a pleasure to be able to do these shows. Uh, they always are so fun. And so I uh, hope everybody's enjoying it. Hope everybody's enjoying the info. And I uh, can't wait to bring more. Could be a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. Appreciate you guys as always. Don't forget to hit like, subscribe, tell your mom and them, all that fun stuff. Yeah. We're here to stay, and we're going to only cook up more in the lab. So that's going to do it for us on Second and Saints tonight. Guys, be good people. Stay safe out there, and we will talk at you when we're in California. Y'all have a good one, guys. Thanks. <laughs>